four that King said. Well, that's the fourth one that makes all the difference in the world. I'm going to title the message tonight, Bandages for Sinners. Band-Aids. Band-Aids. Band-Aids for Sinners. A lot of preaching points you to your sins. A lot of preaching is caught up with what you're doing. And so therefore you set about and work to deal with the issue of what you're doing. That seems logical. But the problem is God's not concerned so much about what you're doing. He's concerned about who you are. This is why the gravest sins in the Bible have to do with your relationship with God personally. Do you remember when David said after he had, uh, had, uh, had, had uh, the man put to death, carried his, his, uh, his death warrant to the front, Joab gave it to him, told the commanders when he gets up to the front uh, to withdraw from him? Well, here's what, uh, here's what David said. He said, against thee and thee only have I sinned. Now, how do you figure that? Well, don't you turn with me in your Bible to Mark chapter number 2 and verse 17. Mark chapter 2, verse 17. Now, what you're going to see here is the mind of God and the way God relates to us and talks to us. Sometimes he'll say a thing that will make you search, seek out, look, pray over it, read it. The Bible is a rich book. It's powerful. But uh, most people spend all their time reading the surface of the Scripture, that part which is so obvious. I want you to look at this now. Mark chapter 2, verse 17. When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And be seated. Father, bless your word now. Give me the gift of teaching it. So what's he talking about? We have people who don't need to repent or they don't need to get right with God. Is that what it means? On the surface of it, that's what it would seem like, wouldn't it? He says, uh, I came to call sinners to repentance. You mean some people are not sinners? Well, look over here in John chapter number 8. Verses 6 and 7. Well, let the Bible answer its own question. One of the great things about learning and studying the Scripture is that you find out everything that the Scripture has to say about something. You have to compare it. You have to do that. Then you have to think to yourself, well, maybe the Bible did not say everything that could be said about something, which is very possible. See what I mean? He said, I have many more things to say to you, but you're not able to bear them. Now look at John 8, verse 6. This they said, tempting him, that they might have access, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger, wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, now watch this, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Was he not saying by this that you're all sinners? Of course he is. That's exactly what he said. So what I've done is compare Scripture with Scripture, see, to get an understanding of the Bible concept of a thing. And like I say again, read everything the Bible has to say about it, but sometimes the issue, the Bible doesn't say everything there could be said about it. He gives us what we know, what we need to know. But at this time, it is, uh, if you are without sin, you go ahead and cast the first stone. So obviously, the presence of Christ brought conviction to them. Now, what he wrote in the ground, we don't know. I've heard a lot of different speculation. I myself might have preached some of it 30, 40, 50 years ago. Who knows? But nobody knows what he wrote in the ground. Nobody. And that's not an issue. Well, for example, this is one of those things where the Bible doesn't say everything there is to say about it, as a matter of fact, because the Bible could have told you what he wrote in the ground. But he didn't. So what is, uh, what is a Band-Aid for sin? For sin. A Band-Aid for sins is when you spend all your time naming your list of sins. Some churches specialize in certain sins that they condemn. Other churches specialize in other sins that they condemn. 
This doesn't mean that you're condoning anything. What it means is that you've got your direction wrong. Band-aid for sin is to talk about the sin itself and not the source of that sin. A band-aid for sin is to tell the person that they can do something about their problem which they cannot. The one who died on the cross 2,000 years ago took care of what can be done about your problem. And a lot of people spend their lifetime, decades, trying to serve the Lord, and they're really not conscious of what's really going on deep down in their soul. Over well, the book of 1 John, chapter number 1, verses 6 and 7, I titled this The Birthplace of Sin. This is only one of them, but this one is very important because the Bible says if we have fellowship with Him, and walk, if, we have not, if we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. So what's it mean to walk in darkness? It means to walk without the light of Christ opening up your soul and speaking to you like no one else can. It's not my job and it's, I don't have the ability to look into your heart and tell you everything that's wrong with your heart. I can't do that. I mean, I'm fallible. I'm a human being just like all the rest of you. So he puts great emphasis on this because he talks about it being walking in the light. They do not the truth. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, or Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. That cleanseth is a present thing, a present active thing. In other words, he is cleansing us from all sin. Can you imagine that he's cleansing you of a sin that you're not even conscious of? Of course he is. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. The scripture talks about, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Mind can change. Your mind can change a dozen times throughout a day or even more. And, uh, but the heart is the, is, is the source. Now I want you to look at 1 John 2, 1. My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So you've already got a God-appointed lawyer. What's that mean? He's appointed in anticipation of something. He knows what you're going to do. It's not that the Holy Ghost or the Father looks over at the Son and says, you know what? You're going to become an advocate for these. Oh, no, no. He bought that and paid for it with a sinless, perfect life, which is an entirely different message in itself. In 1 John chapter number 3 and verse number 9, look at the nature of a born-again believer. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. Well, this forces me then to ask the Bible when he talks about me or who I am or what I'm made of, what does the Bible say about me? Well, it says this, I'm body, soul, and spirit. I'm a spirit being that has a soul living in a body. That's what it is. That's what it is. That's what we are. And therefore, the, the soul is not born again. And certainly the body, the body's not. Dust thou art, dust return. The best that you can ever do with the body is bring it into subjection. In other words, whip it to walk right and still at that, you better watch every step it takes. And when I say step, I'm talking about its mind. Its mind, its thinking faculties. Because your old nature is in constant battle with your new nature over your soul. Yes, over your soul. So, uh, he that is born of God doth not commit sin. Well, what part's born again then? The spirit. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And of course it would be because God is a spirit. And since you've been made in the image of God, therefore you bear the image of God. You first bore the image of the earthy. Now you're going to bear the image of the heavenly. And then there's this one. 1 John 5:16. The choice of a born-again believer to sin unto death. If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is unto death, he shall not ask, he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. Now that's intercessory prayer. And he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. A brother sees another brother sin. He doesn't get up on the housetop and shout it to everybody. He doesn't get on the telephone and call everybody in the country and say, would you believe what I saw so-and-so doing? No, what he does, or he or she, he enters into intercessory prayer for that individual. Now, if he's got the wisdom of God 
and he should have, according to the book of Galatians chapter 6, it says, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one. All right. I thought if you made noise, you're spiritual. No. <laughs> There's nothing to do with being spiritual. Now some folks make noise. I'm not against noise. Well, you ought to hear me when I try to sing. That's all the noise you want to hear. But spiritual has to do with a walk with God, somebody in fellowship with the Lord. So what does he do? Well, if he sees his brother or sister sinning a sin unto death, sin a sin unto death. In other words, he knows that that Christian is going down a path that leads to death, and that's the sin unto death for them. The sin unto death for one individual may not be the same sin unto death for another. This is why it's not mentioned. It's the state of your spiritual walk with God. See how important that is? If the Bible had said, uh, uh, if you see a brother committing adultery, which is the sin unto death, then, oh, then we've got something to go by, don't we? But that's not the sin unto death, necessarily. It's your attitude and relationship with the Lord. And so it ends with that, and that's something I just wanted to bring before you once again. I mentioned we went through 1 John a few weeks ago. The apostle says this, though. He said, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. I hear a lot of people today, and a lot of preachers today, and a lot of people talking about how that essentially, uh, you know, they live above it. They're sinless. Stuff like that. Well, you're not. And you're deceiving yourself. You're living in fantasy world. Because a person that does that, does this. He has shut off what he's doing in his mind and created his own system of righteousness, and he's living by that. Well, another word for that is self-righteousness. And self-righteousness, folks, is one of the worst sins in the Bible. You better believe it. You better believe it. Self-righteousness is a horrible thing because you have rejected the righteousness of Christ. And the righteousness that Abraham, when he looked into the heavens and believed God, and God counted it to him for righteousness, that's a good thing. But nowhere in that Old Testament does it say that God or Christ or anyone was made unto them righteousness. But the Lord Jesus is in 1 Corinthians, he is made unto us righteousness. In plain words, Christ is my righteousness. That's what it means. So what's that mean? That drives me, forces me to the Son of God and to fellowship with the Lord. Now don't you notice 1 John deals with fellowship. All right? Let's look at some of the deeper things that really affect how you're going to live your life. One of them's lack of trust. You realize that? The Bible said the Lord knoweth them that put their trust in him. This is one of those things that you can go to church, smile real pretty, smell good on Sunday, never miss a meeting, and you're the finest upstanding Christian in the church, and you're one of the sorriest people that ever walked this earth in trusting God. You're trusting yourself. But it's not obvious. Why? It is a deeply spiritual sin. Sin originates with your relationship with God completely and absolutely. That's where it originates. It doesn't originate in you. It originates in your refusal to let God be God and who he is. And once you do that, Pandora's box is opened up. There's a lack of patience. Do you think that's a sin? Of course it's a, it's a sin. How about a lack of belief? You suppose that to be a sin? Of course it is. It's a sin. And then what about lack of submission? You submit yourselves to the mighty hand of God. Humble thyself the sight of the Lord. Submission, you say. Well, I'm a leader. I don't need to. Yeah, you need to submit more. Because you start looking at yourself for leadership. And our leadership doesn't come from ourselves. It comes from God. These are important. First John, that I just gave you, deals with fellowship a lack of fellowship and notice it starts with fellowship and ends up with death by one who commits a sin into death see what I mean as long as you stay in fellowship with the Lord as long as you're talking to God and God's talking to you you got a prayer life in the Bible and you know in your heart of hearts that you don't know of anything more I can do do you know what chastening is most people think that chastening is God's judgment on you and he's punishing you. See? Well, you go over there first, at, uh, go over there in Hebrews. 
and read that. Read it carefully, chapter 12. Not a matter of punishment, it's a matter of instruction. When you go through, when you go through something like I've been through, hell on earth, you go through something like that, don't you think you can take a little notice of what's going on in your soul? You suppose, you, suppose I, you suppose I looked deeply within myself and said to myself, Lord, if there was some sin in particular that God wanted to deal with, he'll deal with it, okay? Now, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. But did you know through all that time there was no particular sin that God called to my attention? Now think about it for a moment. I'm not saying I'm sinless. Can you get the nuance of what I'm trying to say? That's what I'm trying to say to you. If I was off into something that I shouldn't have been into, you better believe that when, when your health is gone, the Bible said, he that suffereth has ceased from sin. <laughs> you can believe that if you're off in something and the Almighty drops his hammer on your head, you're going to start looking at what you've been doing. You've been running from God. You've been hiding. And now you realize you're wasting your time trying to run and hide. He's done caught up with you. So what do you do? Well, you get right. That's what you do. You get right. On the other hand, when the Almighty starts dealing with you, what do you do? Get mad at him? Run from him? No. What you do is say, Lord, I love you. I'm... I may do a lot of things, but I'm not going to turn on you. I can't live without you. I've got to have you. I need you. Amen. And day after day after day, that thought works in your soul and in your heart. He begins to show you things. He begins to communicate with you. Things that you probably could have never gotten any other way. And he did me. When you realize the mortality of your flesh... It has a way of getting your attention. How many believe that? <laughs> you better believe it to get your attention. So here's what he says. Those I love, I what? And I scourge every son that I receive. Right? Yes, 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 sir. And I'm going to tell you something else, too. And I don't want to glory for anything. But by the time you get to 77 years in this old world, you've learned a few things, I hope. I mean, you take a young man, he's got a lot to learn. <laughs> oh, yeah. A lot of young men fired up by the flesh and hormones, and that's all they think about. But when you're 77 years old, you've got a long way you can look back and see some of the dumb things you've done. And you'll learn this, God is faithful. He's not only faithful to stand by your side and help you when you need him, he's faithful to be God. And when he, be, when he becomes God in every sense of the word, please don't run from him. Please don't turn from him. Run to him. And say, Lord, I didn't, I didn't even realize I needed you that much. And even through all of it, you still won't get a hold of the fact of how much we need him. John 15, verse 5, he says, Without me, ye can do nothing. Now, is that an all-inclusive word? Does that mean nothing? Or does it mean, well, you can't fix this problem, but you might be able to fix that problem? No. It means without him, we can do nothing. And I got to learn my lesson. I want to learn my lessons. There's lessons to learn in life. And uh, I want to learn them. Believe it or not, I still enjoy learning. I really do. <laughs> I really do. I've got the kind of mind, man. That I want to know. I enjoy learning. <laughs> yeah, they've got it. They've got a. How many of you wear contact lenses? Did you know they've got a contact lens now they can put on your eyeball, on your eyeball that has a camera in it, and a whole computer system, and as you walk down the street, you can be videoing people around you that don't even know they're being videoed, and you have access to information. That's the new technology that's coming out now. Did you know that in artificial intelligence, AI, you all know what a drone is. Did you know now they're, they, have, they have reached the point with artificial intelligence that they can take a drone that has been programmed and given artificial intelligence and say, go kill so-and-so. And that drone will find out where they live. It'll stalk them. 
It'll find out the best time to do the job, and it will kill them. And here's their worry. Their worry is that these things are becoming so smart that they can turn on the ones that made them and kill them. That's the technology that's out there right now. That's the technology. And you know, all that phone you've got in your house and all this other stuff you've got, if you value your privacy, and I do, <laughs> uh, you'd look at stuff like that. I'm so old-fashioned, didn't have enough sense to know the difference. I won't use the full term, but did you know that that smartphone can dial somebody and you don't even know it? How many knew that? <laughs> Well, my smartphone dialed somebody here a few weeks ago, and I didn't have a clue. But it's a good thing I was listening to a preacher. <laughs> and whoever got dialed, <laughs> she's in here tonight. She knows what I'm talking about. She heard that same preacher. Now, what if I'd have had a strip tease going on? <laughs> you know, what if I'd had something like that going on? So, but I had to learn. I had to learn the hard way. Didn't know it, man. When I Listen, I grew up where you didn't have a dime. You couldn't make a phone call. You had to put, I, I grew up where you had, had uh, uh, dialing instead of punching buttons. I remember when buttons came to Knoxville. We got a button phone, a, what, a push button phone. That's a big deal, boy. I used to walk by and look at that thing. Man, oh, why? I mean, all that time. Uh, thing, I've watched a lot of stuff in my few years on this earth. I've watched them change. So... Uh, that's just a little warning to you. If you've got a smartphone, well, <laughs> be careful what you're doing. <laughs> you're liable to call somebody and they hear everything you say. That could be kind of embarrassing, couldn't it? Amen. So, yes, I do. I want to know what God says. I want to know what he says. So, when I read this again, it says this. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners... They said unto his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Well, here's the bottom line. Until you accept the fact that you're a sinner, acknowledge it, own up to it. That's what my grandfather used to say to me. I did something wrong. He'd say, own up to it. Well, I don't know how many times he told me that. Don't, don't blame somebody. You own up to it. <laughs> and so you have to own up to the fact that you are a sinner. Yes, sir. That doesn't mean that you've been out here running around doing this or that. But the bottom line is, Paul said, there is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. That's right. And he that says he has no sin deceives himself right so I am proud of it I'm not proud of it but there's two of me there's that double dual nature and if you ever get the dual nature right in the New Testament the, old, the New Testament will open up for you amen so yes I am a sinner and I need forgiveness for sins that I'm not even conscious of aware of but I know good and well I'm not perfect and without a question I'm not perfect and uh, but I do know this too I do know that I crawl in my closet and get on my knees, shut the door and turn the lights out. Hallelujah to God. <laughs> yeah, I do. I get in there and I get down there and get a hold of God. I tell him I love him and he tells me he loves me. <laughs> I come out of there refreshed. My soul's been moved. Still a sinner? Yeah. But I love him and he knows I love him. And when I tell him tonight that I love him, he knows I love him. Do you love him? Yes. He's been good to us, hasn't he? Amen. Yes, he has. Father, bless your word. and Thank you for the little time we've had together here. Our Father, we pray for our dear missionary brother, Brother Pippin and his family back there. We pray for him, his work, and what, you, what you're going to do with him and what you're, what, what you're using him for here. We pray for him. Pray for all of his needs. Pray you to watch over them. Keep them safe, Father. Thank you, Lord. You've been good to us. Be with us now as we leave out of here. Bring us home again safely this coming Sunday. In my holy name I pray. Amen. Good. Good. Amen.
Well, good night. Yes, you better believe it. If you had a thousand and ten show up in here for prayer, that'd be wonderful, wouldn't it? Amen. All right. Yes, sir.